with the Robertson Program for Inquiry-Based Teaching in Math and Science, and we're just very excited to have all of you join us today. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, because I'm in Toronto, I actually find myself on the ancestral traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. I am, and the Robertson Program, is committed to learning from and working with our Indigenous colleagues and friends as we continue to find new ways to engage children in math and science. I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. It's Jason Jones. Jason Jones is Anishinaabe Maywin from Nikigunz Minikaning. Jason teaches Anishinaabe Maywin at Fort Francis High School in Fort Francis, Ontario, and he develops Indigenous curriculum for the Rainy River District School Board. Jason also works with Taking It Global. And in 2019, Jason received the Role Model of the Year Award from Inspire. I also wanna say that Jason has been a dear friend to the Robertson Program for many years. We've worked together to research spatial reasoning in the early years. And Jason's entire community actually welcomed more than 100 educators to their community when we held a conference in the Rainy River area a few years ago. So Jason, thank you so much for once again being here for the Robertson Program. We're so happy to have you here. Miigwech. Wow, it doesn't even feel like years, eh? It just feels like uh, last year or something, hey? Eh? I know, right? <laughs> That's just because yeah. COVID didn't even happen, Jason. Uh huh. <laughs> All right. So, Buju, Nin me mushkwe gabo, Buju nindote, and the Gusmini Koning nindonji, Buju nindote. So, so my name is Jason, and I I've developed curriculum for the school board. Um, I also work with a company called Taking a Global, um, developing curriculum. Um, the presentation you're going to see tonight is um, something that I've, I've created with uh, the help of my family. Every year we try and get wild rice and uh, this year the wild rice wasn't um, wasn't too plentiful. Uh, we had kind of a, a hot spell that happened in the summertime and it kind of dried out some of the uh, wild rice. So a little bit unfortunate when you're picking wild rice, um, some of the husks were empty this year. So it was hard to get wild rice this year. But the cool thing about that is that um, if, you, if you pick the year before, um, wild rice keeps for a long time. So I still got rice from last year that I could um, that I use. So um, I guess we'll save um, some, if you guys have any questions, uh, just put them in the chat and, you know, Zach will put his hand up and we'll get going. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen and here we go. Manumanaka, so I'm gonna throw in some Ojibwe words in here. Uh, Manumanaka means there's a lot of wild rice. And if you look at this bay right here, um, you can see all the wild rice that's growing. Uh, typically grows in kind of shallow, shallowish areas, slow moving water. Um, I, I've picked here before. Uh, this is one of our spots that we like to pick at. Um, I know that uh, before we get um, before we get going, one thing that we do at the beginning of the year before the ricing season is somebody will go and get some wild rice, um, usually about enough for a meal, and they'll pick it first and we'll have a ceremony. So that ceremony is really important because we need to acknowledge the, the spirits of the wild rice and so that we have a safe picking season. Um, you know, sometimes accidents happen. Maybe somebody might tip over in a canoe um, and you don't want that to happen. So doing it in a proper way, uh, starting out with ceremony is always the, is always the best thing to do. Um, wild rice wasn't actually a part of um, Anishinaabe culture um, until, uh, until we moved here. So um, wild rice was uh, sort of introduced like in, in when we moved over here, we weren't always living here. We were living on the East Coast. I'll chat a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, there's many ways to pick wild rice. So everything that you see in this presentation isn't the way to do it. Sometimes I get a little bit hesitant when I'm, when I'm presenting because sometimes people think like this is the only way to do it or this is the right way to do it. There's actually many ways to do it. And one of the things that happens whenever we make um, like something documented or something like on a PowerPoint or on a website, um, it kind of limits it sometimes because um, we're always growing, you know, every, we're always growing and getting better. So um, when you do a presentation, it kind of, kind of limits it and thinks like, that's it, that's all it can do, but it's actually growing. So we'll show some examples of that in the presentation coming up. Um, we're also taught to be respectful of different teachings so that if uh, somebody does it a different way or they've seen it done a different way, um, we got to remember that that's their way 
and it's not better or worse it's just a different way to do it so keep an open mind when we're doing this um i want to talk a little bit about some ojibwe words um so you might hear this word monomen monomen so there's different variations on what it means all of them are correct uh, I like this word because uh, it's actually a spirit food in Anishinaabe culture. Um, so when uh, you'll find when you're when you're cooking it and when you're eating it, you'll find that uh, there's a lot of laughter happening. So um, that's kind of like your your spirit um, being being happy that it's being fed as well. So Anishinaabe people have um, three things that are inside of them, three spirits, three of these spirits, and they're all alive. One of them is your your spirit, your soul. The other one is your, your body, which is a spirit, and uh, your, your mind, which is also a spirit. So when all three of these things are happy, that's when you can find true happiness. So I need to acknowledge that part because manomen is a spirit food. So it's like you're, you're feeding your spirit when you're eating uh, manomen. Uh, the word manomen has a couple of different translations. Uh, mine, mine the, one, the way that I've heard it was uh, manomen is a uh, money do min, money do min. And money do is a spirit, and min means like uh, sort of like berry like, and um, so it kind of got shortened over time, where it, it turned into uh, manomen. So money do min, money do min, kind of got shortened over time into manomen. Uh, the other one you could uh, use. This one's a really good one too. Mino min uh, it has really good word parts. Mino is actually a word part you hear quite a bit in Ojibwe. Mino, and then min is berry like. And if you're a Ojibwe language nerd like me who just wants to keep learning and learning and learning, uh, what I found was that when you find these word parts like mino and min, uh, it needs two or more to create a sentence or a word. So mino by itself doesn't mean anything. Min by itself doesn't mean anything. If you put them together, um, they create that word manomen. All right. So I kind of skipped over one slide here. There we go. So I was talking earlier about monomen. It wasn't always part of our culture. Um, I got to give some history on this uh, before we get into the presentation. Um, Anishinaabe people, Ojibwe people, um, used to live on the East Coast. Uh, you're talking about uh, like Labrador, Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, out that way. And there was actually this prophecy that told us that we had to migrate where food grows on water or else we would be destroyed. And people tend to think that it happened uh, around the year 900. That's when the migration started inward, inland. And we started going towards um, uh, where food grows on water. And there were like seven different stopping places. Along these stopping places, um, some Ojibwe stopped and um, uh, decided to live there. So that's why you have uh, Ojibwe people, Anishinaabe people, uh, living all the way from... Uh, from the east coast all the way up to uh you know even manitoba even parts of um saskatchewan and alberta uh different uh, different um dialects come into play there um og cree cree odawa uh, all these all the potawatomi all of these ones are part of the uh, algonquin language family so they have roots in this uh, migration so food growing on water is is thought to be wild rice and that's what we're going to be talking about today, food growing on water. Um, so Anishinaabe kind of settled in uh, Minnesota, a little bit of Ontario and Michigan. And that's where a lot of the wild rice is. And that's where we, um, that's where we're told to go. So that's where we live. Um, when wild ricing, uh, traditionally what I've seen uh, our community do is um, normally you'd go in rows. You'd create a row. And you go in a straight line and you go back and then create another row. So as you're going, kind of going back and forth, you're creating these lanes. And as you're creating these lanes, uh, less and less rice is coming off of the stock. Um, but we got to remember that not all the rice is fully grown yet when it's, when it's uh, being harvested. So it's at different stages, even though it's on the same stock, it's at different levels of growth. So um, the ones that are ripe will fall off right away. So you go down those lanes, you create those lanes, and you harvest the wild rice and the ones that are ready fall off into your canoe and then you uh, you kind of give it a break you know for a couple days um, usually about three days you give it a break and then it actually starts to grow again and then on the third day uh, you go out there again and you pick 
you pick those rows and your rows are already created. Now these rows come into play a little bit later because um, when you first go through, um, the rice is really thick and it's hard to, to push through them. So it's hard for the, for the person in the back, um, uh, the person in the front to actually get through the wild rice. You know, you need somebody that's, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't get tired easy, that's willing to put the, the time and the work in to, to pull the canoe. So um, it's important that you create these rows, especially when it's really thick like this. You might not um, need to do that if the rice is a little bit thin this year. So some factors that go into this, um, you know, if we look at the seasons um, in the summertime that you can see it floating on top of the water. And um, what really affects it is, is the height of the water. It's kinda, it's gotta stay at that same level throughout the summer. And up here in Rainy Lake, um, the water level really like fluctuated all summer. And it kind of got really low, like even now, you know, like probably about a week ago, I noticed that the water level is almost like a foot lower. So that kind of kind of hindered our, our season for wild ricing. Um, the rice doesn't really like changes like that, uh, the water level going up and down. So if you imagine uh, the water, the stock growing out of the water and all of a sudden the water drops, that stock becomes heavy and it becomes so heavy that it can't support itself and then it'll fall down. So, um, so that's one thing that, that is a factor for for good ricing season. Another one is um, is, uh, is is the the water like the the rain. I didn't know that that was a factor until this year. But um, rice actually needs rain, even though it grows in the water, which I I didn't um, I didn't know until this year. You know, we had uh, we had a low uh, low count of wild rice this year, and it was a combination of the less rain and um, and more heat. Uh, and that was the other thing I wanted to talk about too, was the heat. When wild rice is growing, it's usually in a, in a liquid form. And in early, um, early August, you know, late, late July, once it starts to stand up out of the water, um, you can look inside the husk, they'll probably be, be empty, but you can start seeing um, liquid growing inside of there. It's kind of like a white milky liquid. And that uh, later turns into wild rice. Um, and that's what happened uh, this summer to us was that the heat got so intense for a long period of time that that liquid actually evaporated, uh, evaporated out of the out of the husks. So we we're kind of bummed out about that, and um, it kind of happened all over the place um, where we are. So that was a little bit unfortunate. Um, the other thing to think about too is um, where where you get the rice from. If you're in the river, um, wild rice tends to grow a lot faster in the river because um, there's not a lot of things that are hindering it. You got that steady flow of water that's coming in and out um, as well as um, it's kind of like condensed. You know, there's a lot of trees around and there's not really a lot of things that are um, stopping it from growing. So uh, it's got sunlight all day and river rice. Uh, that's the trick. If you want to go out and get some wild rice, get some, get some river rice first. That one's ready first. And then when you follow it uh, uh, about a week later, um, the other rice that's on the lake where there's more, rice, more wild rice, that's where you're gonna find um, everybody picking is, is, is on the lakes. Um, so you do that for three days, you give it another break and then uh, do, another, do another round of it on the third day again, which is actually probably the sixth, the sixth day. Um, that's the way they've been doing it uh, a long time ago. Um, nowadays, people tend to go almost every day and uh, the reason they go every day is like they'll pick in one area and then maybe the next day they'll pick in a different area. And then the third day they'll pick in another area. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's the fourth day you go back to the original area. Um, and then the rice had some time to grow. So it's pretty neat when you do that. And that's the way it was done um, a long time ago. Um, and, and the other thing with that too, um, wild rice is, is greenish. If you look at it, it's got a green, green color to it. And uh, when, you, when you pick it that same day um, and you take it off and let it dry and then you do the whole process to it, yeah, people call that green rice. It's really good for, um, um, what do you call it, for soups. So if you ever see it, it's, it's good. 
Um, another Ojibwe word that I'm going to talk about, bawaganak. Bawaganak is a rice knocker. And here, here's the word parts in here. Um, Bow means to knock. Oh, ah, with a glottal stop is to act on it with a medium or a tool. A gun turns it into an object. And this ending, awk, turns it into like organic solid. So if you can kind of uh, look at Ojibwe language as a visualization language, it, they're giving you all of these word parts to figure out um, what, what you're talking about. And over time, you just know these words. Um, the type of wood, it's important that we use um, cedar because cedar is a light wood and uh, we don't want to damage the, the crop. We don't want to damage the wild rice. You know, even though we're out there threshing it and you're kind of you're hitting it, um, you got to be careful too that you don't uh, like crack the stock or anything like that. Because if you crack the stock, then uh, all, the, all the wild rice on that stock is, um, is going to die. So those other three days that you gave it a break uh, wouldn't matter. So that's why we use um, cedar. You need to be gentle with, uh, with the wild rice. Um, yeah, so, so we don't use hardwoods, you know, otherwise um, you, you would break them. And if you look uh, at these rice knockers too, they're sanded as well. So they're sanded, so they're, they're not really, they don't have any sharp edges on there. They can't really, you know, get slivers from them or put slivers into the stock. So um, try to be respectful when we're out uh, doing this with the wild rice. Uh, here's my uncle, uh, here's my uncle Dennis, um, somebody that I look up to, Bawashkam. Again, we have that word bow again, you know, to knock, and then a sh on the body, and then um turns it into a, a, an animate intransitive verb. Um, so you guys can see at his um, in his image, if you can see how he's kind of bending the the rice into the canoe, and that's really important because um, if you, if you do it outside the canoe, then you're probably not going to get too much wild rice. Um, it's a good idea just to bend it in there, uh, kind of knock it, almost like you're you're flaying fish. If there's any um, anybody that likes to fish out there, who's flayed fish, it's kind of that that motion that you're going to be doing. So he, he bends it in there. And then he knocks it down into the into the canoe. Uh, here's a here's a closer view of it. Uh, you can kind of see how it's bent. Um, and then you can see on the stock there that maybe somebody had uh, went through there already. Uh, you can look closely on there, and you can see that there's not really too much uh, wild rice on there. So I I don't know if he knew that that day, but uh, I can tell in this image that there's hardly any wild rice on there. Um, oh, uh, yeah, so there's other ways that you can uh, push your canoe with. And typically what I, what I see in our community is people sitting at the front and um, paddling the canoe. And the water really isn't that deep. The water is usually about, eh, about three feet, um, three feet deep is, is about the average that I see, maybe even less. Um, so this word up here is gone to Keganok. If you guys can look in the back, behind him he's got this uh this pole sticking up and uh that's called gone to keganok gone to keganok and um again uh, some word parts in here gone is to put force on something a key is earth act on with a medium a gay um turns it into a verb and then a gun turns it into a back into a noun and then awk it's made out of wood um, so that's what uh, that's what that push pole is in the back, and it's really it's really kind of long, you know. It's almost like uh, over ten feet long. So, so typically, somebody would be standing up, and as they're standing up, they would kind of push the canoe, and and push it right through those shallow areas. Uh, you see a lot of this in Minnesota. I see it often in Minnesota where people are pushing their the canoes through the through the rice rice paddies, and um, it's really shallow water. Uh, where they are. It's almost like a foot, foot of water. So they do it a little bit different over there. Um, not to say that way is better or worse. It's just another way that you can do it. Um, yeah, make sure you uh, put some of this wild rice back in the water as well. Um, one of the things that we think about is, is being respectful um, to, the, to the wild rice. So we got to make sure that we're um, putting some of these seeds back in the water as well. Uh, some of the birds tend to do it uh, on their own like they'll come in there they'll land on some and they'll shake them and then as they're eating them some will fall back into the water 
and that, that makes sure that we have um, growth for, for the following year. So we got to be respectful that way as well. Uh, switching side to side, uh, you can see he was on the on his right side. Now he's on his left side. Uh, this is more of um, you know you don't want to have too much muscle on one side. If if you're wild racing on one side, then you know just your right side is gonna is gonna get the workout. Um, so he goes on both sides. So that's important. Uh, the other thing is uh, clothing. If you have clothing like like a track pants that could um, just kind of um, bounce off of you, kind of like rain gear sort of. Uh, you can use some of that, uh, and that will uh, that will make sure that the wild rice goes back into the canoe, and it doesn't stick to you. Um, manumine, manumine money douche, manumine, manumine, manumine money douche shug is ladybugs. Um, I like this word because money do uh, manomin, manomin is uh, is wild rice, and then money douche is the bug, and in there you have money douche. Um, sounds like money do, which is a spirit. Um, so that's, it has that connection there. And the reason it has that word uh, spirit in there for bugs is because typically when you see spirits, they're really tiny balls of light. You know, they're really tiny, like, uh, like an insect, like, so that's where that word comes from. Uh, there's a lot of insects in here too. Uh, you see spiders in there. You know, some people get scared when they're out ricing, they might see a spider in the canoe. Um, so if you don't like spiders, you know, it, um, you're gonna have to find a way to, to get past that. Um, there's also little tiny worms in there too. They're white. Uh, they look, they're really tiny too. So I heard that the only time I see those type of worms are, are when we're out racing. All right, let's keep going here. So, uh, one of the things too, like, uh, that I love to do is just kind of like take a break and just um, be in awe, be in awe of all of creation. Like at some point, you know, the creator created all of this and then, uh, and then he created you and I. So it's just really cool just to kind of take a break and just admire uh, the scenery and where you are. Uh, every time I look at this image, I, I look at the lake and I, a certain sense of calmness comes over me. Manomene um, uh, Mushkimud, a wild rice bag. Um, so this is my uncle Dennis. It looks like he's getting a little tired out from lifting that, even though he's been lifting it for about two or three seconds. Um, so, so this is my uncle Dennis. This is one of the guys that, uh, kind of taught me a lot about wild racing. Um, these are the bags they use too. Um, these bags, um, have good, uh, airflow in them. And, and it's really good that you have airflow with wild rice because one of the things that can happen is your your rice can get rotten if you if you store it um you know in, in a kind of like in a basement or a place that has a lot of moisture you it's probably not a good idea to do that uh, the wild rice will get moldy one thing that we tend to do right away is to take it out and um and and dry it out as soon as we're done wild ricing like you put it in this bag in this image but as soon as he got to shore um he probably dried it out right away and gave it a thorough um, drying just from the sun. So you make sure you do that. And it's kind of interesting because um, just a little, like even one grain that's moldy uh, can multiply into your whole bag getting moldy. So that's really important that you do that. Um, this is how the wild rice looks in the canoe. It's, uh, it, this is a good, this is a good haul right here. Um, we call it a Jeshke Manomen. So it's raw or it's fresh manomen. Like that image. Um, all right, getting into the process. Um, for us, there's usually about three different types of firewood that we use. Um, birch, azade, which is poplar, uh, kikon, dug, a jack pine. So on the left, we have the hardwoods and that's, uh, that's the birch. Um, typically you get them in smaller pieces. So this isn't the pile that we'd probably use. They're more like the ones on the right. Um, and this comes into play because the ones on the right, the uh, jack pine, they burn hotter. So if you're using back jack pine all the time, you're probably, um, you're probably going to burn some of your wild rice. So you need to put some of the, some of the other stuff in there, like the poplar or the birch bark or the birch tree. 
and uh, kind of cools it down a bit and also makes coals in the fire. So these coals keep your, um, keep your fire going a little bit longer. And um, the size of the wood, typically when you're making a fire, you tend to use big, big uh, chunks of wood, but not when you're roasting wild rice. You want to make them kind of small. You don't want your flame to get too big or too small. You kind of want it in a middle, a middle level. And this is where uh, this is where we roast the wild rice. You can see those two bars on there. You can kind of adjust it to a different angle. Um, so you got to kind of decide where you're going to put your um, flame, and then there's where your fire would be. So you kind of put the, uh, the roasting tubs, uh, which are in the next slide. Uh, these roasting tubs right here, you'd put them on those bars. Uh, one bar would be uh, um, out of the way, and then you would. You would rest it kind of on an angle, kind of like 45, probably about 45 degrees. And then your flame is underneath. And that's where you, that's where you would um, start roasting. And the process is uh, pretty easy, actually. She's almost demonstrating it right here. This is my grandma. And you kind of just kind of go in circles with the paddle and you're just kind of moving it back and forth. And you're watching the wild rice as well. Uh, for me, what I do is uh, I'll watch it and I'll watch the steam come off of there. You can see uh, the moisture coming out of the out of the wild rice, and that's that's the process right there, is making sure that you um, dehydrate the wild rice. You take it out of there and make sure there's no liquid in there, and that's why wild rice can last so long. So that's what we're doing in here. Typically, what I do is I'll grab two handfuls, I'll put them in the in the tub, and once I got it in there. Um, Usually about 12 minutes, I'll start checking up on it. My flame can't be too high, too low, kind of in the medium. And then I'll just keep stirring it, and stirring and stirring it. Um, if the rice was damp, um, I, I would probably roast it a little bit longer. But because we've dried it, we've, we've left it out in the sun, it's probably going to be dry. So then we'll, we'll start roasting it right away. It's better to roast it as soon as you can, too. Uh, it's not really a good idea to let it sit too long. Again, that moisture is going to come into play. One of the one of the kernels gets moldy; it, it's infectious, and then uh, there goes your whole rice bag. So this is a wild rice tub right here, um, and that's what we use to roast uh, wild rice with. There's another image of it. Um, if you look above there too, there's kind of a roof there. Um, so so we're kind of adapting with changing times, you know. Typically, you know, Usually uh, when it rains, people tend to stop because when you're doing the whole drying, uh, you're trying to dry the wild rice, you know, that doesn't work too well when it's raining. So we try to come up with innovative ways to, to um, keep working so that you can get the, the, the wild rice finished. Um, this is a canvas. Uh, this is where you put uh, the wild rice when it's finished. You put it on the ground when it's really hot and then uh, it dries up just a little bit. So you put the wild rice in there, on top of there, it kind of cools down a little bit. And then it's ready for uh, what typically nowadays, what we use is wild rice machine and they call it a dehusker. And what it does is, uh, I know this is wrapped up in here. I'll give you another image in a second. Um, but what it does is it kind of spins around and then it has air in there and it shoots out all of the, uh, all of the husks off of the uh, wild rice. Now, typically, like, like when we were doing this um, before this, before this machine was created, um, you would have a kid um, have a hole in the ground and he, you would put tobacco in there as your can, or not tobacco, you would put leather in there uh, that looks like this. You'd put it in the ground and then the, the, the rice would go on there. Um, and then the kid wearing uh, moccasins or leather, leather shoes would, would dance on the wild rice and he'd be kind of mixing the wild rice and you know kind of grinding them together kind of getting the uh the husks loose and the kid would do that um in our culture um in our area anyways uh, we don't uh, let uh, females do that uh and it's out of respect um females in our culture are, are more powerful than men and they have this really cool gift called life they have they have the ability to give life um so with that um they're really powerful. So sometimes when, uh, when they're around um, sacred items or they're around things like that, sometimes they can absorb life uh, as well. 
So um, that's why they're not allowed to, is because respect, they're just so, so powerful beings. Um, so the word for this uh, leather moccasins, bashkwag and wakezinan, you know, kind of a tongue twister for some people, bashkwag and wakezinan. Bashkwag is leather, wakezinan is the moccasin, which is the shoes. And this is, um, this is kind of how it looks uh, when it's, um, this is the machine when you open it up, you can kind of see those, uh, that's a two, four, six, eight, nine of them. And they kind of spin around and they got those rubber edges on the on the outside. And that's so you don't damage the wild rice. So it's spinning, it's spinning, it's spinning. And as it's spinning, it's taking the husks off. And there's a there's a fan in there that blows the husks out. Um, so this is a really good process. So this is kind of a teaching too that was taught to us. Um, anytime that I get stuck and I'm wondering, you know. Um, should I do this or should I not do this? Um, you know, it comes into play when we're using technology, when we're learning Ojibwe language. They didn't have, um, they didn't have apps a long time ago to learn Ojibwe language. Um, and we tend to do what our ancestors do and just um, learn language through orally. So nowadays, um, because our language is um, not spoken at home as much and we're at school uh, all day, we got to look for different ways on learning Ojibwe language. And um, it was a teaching that I, that I think was passed down to us from our ancestors. They used to trade um, with the French uh, for metal tools and we would give them pelts. And uh, metal tools like knives, forks, axes, even muskets, um, that's what they would do. And if they didn't uh, adapt with the changing times, um, they didn't survive, they wouldn't have survived. So I tend to think back and I think back to nowadays, um, would my ancestors approve of this um, using this machine to dehusk um, to dehusk? And, and I think the answer would be yeah, because they change with the times, so that's what we should do. So we can learn a lot from looking in the past, and that's where that's where I learned this one from. Um, so the other the other thing that we we still use nowadays is a no scotch noggin, and that's a that's his birch bark basket. There's the top part and there's the bottom part. Uh, you gotta use these really big um, birch trees for this one um, because the baskets are a little bit thicker and longer. You need those longer ones to, uh, to kind of like uh, flip it. So as you're flipping it, um, most of the husks are off, but not all of them. So you pour your uh, wild rice in there once it gets out of that machine and you kind of wait for a windy day and you kind of uh, just kind of fan it up and then it drops back into the basket. And as it drops back into the basket, all of the, the tiny husks that are still left, you know, you maybe have about uh, 10 or 20 of them, um, just little ones that you can pick out. You kind of just kind of husk them out and the wind, um, the wind will push them out. So pick a windy day to do that. It's, uh, it's a good process. And then all these little chunks too, uh, that maybe um, didn't make it through the wild rice process. Um, if you if you leave it in the thresher the thresher too long, it'll actually crack your wild rice. So people don't like uh, cracked wild rice. Um, and so um, so that's what happens if you leave it in there too long, and those will fall out when you're doing this this part of the um, the session. Uh, when you're when you're fanning the wild rice, you might lose some wild rice that was cracked. So that's another reason why people don't do that. This wild, uh, this uh, birch bark basket um, lasts a long time. You know, I, I remember, I literally remember this basket when I was um, uh, like 10 years old. And uh, uh, that's, that's 30 years ago for me. So um, the, it lasts a long time uh, if, you, if, you, if you create it right, if you do it right. So um, I remember this basket. All right, let's keep going. Um, okay, so wild rice is uh, is organic, and uh, this is one of the things that uh, Anishinaabe people are starting to to get back to is, is uh, organic food. Um, this is one of my favorite dishes, uh, wild rice. You know, I've actually got some upstairs that I've been thinking about for the last twenty minutes. Uh, there's a really good wild rice. Um, uh, salad that people tend to make that I like, um, or I'll put uh, some bananas, organic bananas in there, cut them into chunks, 
I have my wild rice and then I'll add some uh, maple syrup to it that uh, that we got that my uncle got uh, this spring. Um, so I put that in there. And the really cool thing about uh, all of this, uh, this wild rice is it lasts a long time. So um, I've seen people have wild rice that was in their cupboards for about 15 years. And uh, I always wondered, you know, like, I hardly see this person um, ricing. And, and, and how do they how do they always have wild rice? And I remember, I remember um, she finally told me that uh, they got a ton of wild rice uh, about 10 years ago and they're still they're still working on it they're still uh, eating it so uh, that's the really cool thing about this and um, this will happen at like a fall harvest you know in our communities around here we have something called a fall harvest where we'll get ready for the winter um, getting through Canada winters are really tough uh, I remember a few years ago when it was like minus 40 for like a whole week um, so getting through the winters um, it's hard to it's hard to get food you know the animals aren't moving there's no plants around um so fall harvest is, is what you need um so drying out your food and this is where wild rice comes into play because you have that that rice that's going to last you throughout the winter um so this rice is really good is really good um yeah so uh like i said i do about 12 minutes um so getting back to the to the wood um Jack pine is the one that's going to make your heat a little bit hotter and, and you throw it in there like uh, usually after one round, like 12 minute round of, uh, of stirring the wild rice. That's when I'll, that's when I'll add some more firewood to it. Um, also, I'll have a, a jar of water. I'll have a jar of water present um, just in case the flame gets a little bit too high. I'll tend to, you know, just put a little water on there. Maybe, maybe you've added some, uh, a little bit too much wood to the fire. You use that fire to, or use that um, water to put out the flame. Um, so, so there's some there's some other neat tricks that tend to happen too with wild rice. Um, you can try this too at, at your house, or if you ever have wild rice and you're going to be gone for a long time, you're going to be outside for a long time. A good thing to do is to to cook it, but only cook it halfway through, uh, half cook it. So it'll taste a little bit hard, but it's um, once you consume it, uh, you, you eat it, you put it in your stomach, um, it actually starts expanding. So as, as it's in your stomach, it starts um, growing bigger and bigger and bigger because it has liquid in there. And this helps you to, to feel more full. So if you're going through a day or you, know, you don't have a lunch break or something like that nowadays, that's what uh, people tend to do is, is kind of just kind of boil it halfway through and then whatever else you're going to add to it if you're going to make a salad or you're going to have like a cream of mushroom soup or make a soup out of it uh, you can add it uh, add that to it and um, just eat it and and you'll feel full for the most of the day so that's a neat little trick that my grandma had uh, had passed on to me and uh, she didn't know it but at the time when she was a kid she was being taught all of these things you know uh, it just happened and then she always wondered why and then later on as you become an adult you start to figure out that hey you know there's a reason why this happened and uh, oh she was trying to teach me to be full because she knew that I was going to be outside all day and that's what my grandma was doing she was being outside playing with her friends all day so she doesn't ever remember going hungry and that's just a little uh, little trick that people can do um, wow so many so many ways to to cook wild rice um some people like it plain you can just consume it that way uh, i like it with uh, with maple sugar or maple syrup it's a good little snack you can have throughout the day um popped wild rice is a, is a new one that uh, that we that we like to use um my friend uh shelly shelly jones was really good at uh, popping the wild rice we did a session on it and um I don't know. When I think of experts or, or people that are really good at it, that's who that's who I think of as Shelly. Uh, she did a good job on that. Um, and it's kind of like uh, if anyone's ever had like Rice Krispies before, um, that's that's kind of what happens with it. You pop it and you make it in oil, and you kind of you got to use kind of one of those metal strain strainers, and uh, you kind of dip it in there. And then once it pops, you take it out, and you put it put it off to the side, let it cool off. 
Another really neat one you can use is uh, wild rice crispy squares. Uh, you know, throw some marshmallows in there. Um, so there's a lot of different recipes. So whenever we're, we're messing around with wild rice, like if you want to um, make different recipes too, um, yeah, it's open to that. Like, like wild rice is meant to um, to have to enjoy and to have food. Um, so that's that's kind of what wild rice is. This is how it looks up close. Um, so I can look at it really close. I can see that some of it is kind of cracked. Also, it's kind of got this little, um, almost looks like powder that's on it. I notice this with the wild rice. So what I do to, to get that powder off is once you, once you put it into your pot that you're gonna cook with, um, the powder tends to come off and some of it will float to the top. Maybe there's something that you missed during the process. Maybe there's a husk in there, or maybe, um, maybe there's something on your wild rice. Good thing to do is just to, um, uh, skim the top of it because all of the excess comes to the top and you just kind of skim it off of the uh, off of the water and you take it out um, yeah so that's uh, that's that's kind of wild that's how wild rice is um, so much to learn about wild rice like this is just some things that uh, that I was taught I know that I kind of skimmed over the process a little bit fast um, and you know, I could chat about some of those too if you want. We have some extra time yeah, Jason, right now. Why don't, you, why don't you do a little bit more of the process? I have I have some questions, but maybe yeah. spend about, uh, just three four minutes on the on the actual the process a bit more. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I, yeah, so I, I was thinking more about uh, this process right here. Hey. Yeah, yeah. So um, so these metal tubs when they go onto the onto the fire um. We, we definitely have to make sure that flame is the right height. Um, typically you go like uh, just kind of halfway above uh, where the, where the uh, let me, I'll show a better image of it. Where I have is just the one, yeah. Kind of like you see where those bars are. So what is that? Probably about 30 centimeters is typically where I, I keep the flame. And then, uh, the, the fire, if you can look in the middle, like right in the middle part right here, that's kind of where the flame goes. And uh, this is this is probably um, what I think is the most important part of the process, because you can't um, you can't burn your wild rice. If you if you start hearing the crackling of it, that's how you know the wild rice is burning. And then that's when you really got to start moving your paddle, you know, in circles, so that the rice doesn't um, burn. And then the other thing too is that you want to um, you want to make sure that you have adequate time to to make sure that all of the the liquid is out of there that there's no there's no moisture to it so your flame can actually be too low sometimes and uh, if you look at the background you can kind of see this blocker thing so that's blocking the wind if uh if your fire is uh if it's really windy that day your flame might not be hitting the 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 tub so the heat is being blown off so you got to make sure that um, the fire is actually getting to the tub to roast to roast it, um, because then all of a sudden you know your temperature is off, and then you know you, you look in there tw twelve minutes later, you you check your rice and you're like you put your hand in there and it's like holy man it's not even hot, um, so so you got to do it a little bit longer, so ha having everything kind of equal everything like uh, making sure that you're um, there's no wind around, that your flame is the right height, uh, that you're using the proper firewood, um, making sure that those factors are all um, the same. So that way you can come up with that number, magic number 12. That's how I came up with 12 minutes. I made sure that um, you know the wind was uh, being blocked. I made sure that the flame was probably about 30 centimeters high at the, at the most, and that the wood, that the flame was consistent as well. It could go a little bit lower than that, but as long as it was between 20 and 30 centimeters, I knew that the temperature was going to be about the same. Um, so that's how that's how I came up with that number 12 minutes. Uh, you can use a timer if you want. Um, some people like if you're really expert at it, you can just kind of watch it and you can kind of see the you can kind of see the moisture coming off of it. You can see the almost looks like a little cloud coming up and all of a sudden you don't see it anymore. And then usually about two or three minutes after that is when I, when I take it off of there. And and there's a lot of different ways people do it too. I, like I've seen people put um, these metal barrels 
over the flame and they have this huge flame and then they have this machine where it's just kind of rolling the barrel like going consistently and it, it has to roast longer because uh it has more rice in it but um that's that's another way you can do it too I, i've seen that way uh i tend to go this way though it tends to be uh, more natural and then i can see the process myself so that i know that the rice was um the rice was cooked properly so again same thing if you don't roast it long enough uh, you could have some moisture in there that little bit of moisture could get um, contagious and then your wild rice becomes moldy and then all of a sudden you did the whole process for nothing um another thing that uh, that we tend to, uh my grandma likes to do is there's tiny tiny holes in here uh, you can't really see them you know but they're they're there and that's um that's to make sure that smoke comes through and that uh, the wild rice has a different taste to it, like more of a natural taste to it. So, so that's her trick. And uh, if anyone's out there, don't tell, don't tell her I told you. But uh, that's that's one of her tricks that she does. So uh, she's 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 got um, she's almost famous for her wild rice. You know, people are like oh, I don't buy any rice unless it's from Nancy Jones. So uh, that's that's her secret. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, those are the roasting tubs. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, that's probably the most important part is the, is the roasting part, making sure that uh, definitely get the moisture out, but at the same time, you don't burn it. Uh, you can taste it if it's burnt. So um, take your time on that one if you're going to do anything, if you're going to focus on something. All right, how are we for time? good for time jason we have some you want to answer a few questions that we've had sure That's okay so one of the first questions we had was uh, it was about the canoe and someone was wondering like do you always harvest the wild rice in a canoe or can you do it without the canoe yeah i mean like i said there's always new ways that people are, are growing um and trying different things i've all i've only seen it done in a canoe, in a canoe. But um, I was um, I was driving um, down the highway one time, and even in these little ponds, you know, that barely have any water in there, they were they had wild rice in there, and uh, I thought, man, if I just had like some hip waders, you know, I could probably walk around in there and just do it by hand, you know, and just grab some of that. And I bet you I would have grabbed like half a bag. Um, there's a, a road called 502, which is uh, going up towards Dryden Highway, and just past there in the ditches, that's where I've seen that wild rice growing. And I thought, wow, you know, I bet you somebody, uh, somebody will try that and maybe they'll create a new way of, of harvesting wild rice. Um, but I, one thing I got to tell people too about, uh, especially when you're picking medicine or, or harvesting near the highway, mm -hmm. try to um, try to wash it before you use it. Because, um, you know, all of the exhaust and everything uh, will go onto the plant. Uh, people don't like to uh, pick near highways uh, just because of the exhaust that goes on goes on there. Right, right. That makes sense to me. Um, okay, one of our one of the uh, someone watching uh, uh, comes from Vietnam. Uh, the region is Mekong Delta, and they just mentioned that this wild rice reminds them of of home. And they said that the wild rice is also called ghost rice because of its strength and it has never died any under, under any conditions so that's an interesting connection wow that's cool yeah, yeah. earlier like uh, i see different connections like uh, earlier we had this word called uh, gone to keganok and it's mm -hmm. like you use a push pole and you're pushing off the ground and you're pushing the person in the canoe and it reminded me of that word gondolier and i thought oh there's some interesting connections there gone to key gone to keganok and then gondolier hmm this makes you kind of think about things, you know, about more possibilities. Totally, that's so interesting. Okay, well, mm -hmm. one of the one of my questions was uh, uh, around language and the word that you had for ladybug, and you said um, part of the word is bug, part of the word I think you said is, is wild rice, right? And I'm just wondering, in Anishinaabe Mawin, you know, is there more than one word for ladybug, or is it always, you know, wild rice bug? Yeah, there's actually, um, there's actually like uh, uh, three translations that happen when we, when we translate from, um, from Ojibwe into English. So the first one is called a, a literal translation. 
and then an implied translation, and then a cultural translation. So the, the implied translation, when you say, uh, as soon as you say a word like uh, monomone money douche, which is ladybug, people say, oh, that means ladybug. And then they, say, they kind of move on. But in Anishinaabe, when you hear it, you hear the, the uh, literal sentence or the literal part of it, which is manomane, which is wild rice. And then money douche is a bug. And then the ug part is the plural. So then you're thinking, oh, the wild rice bug. Mm -hmm. And then the cultural part to that is that um, possibly he's, uh, he's the keeper of wild rice. Like he's the one that uh, helps the wild rice grow. So he could be a keeper like culturally. So that's when we have those ceremonies that we, um, we, we ask them for help as well, like as their protectors. Um, so that's the cultural translation that goes into it. So it's kind of hard when you translate into English because some people um, are kind of hesitant because they know that there's these three translations that go into English. And the, typically the one that everyone's looking for is just the implied translation. How do you say ladybug, manomane, money douche? Okay. All right. Thanks, Jason. Um, what about, okay, when you finished harvesting or when you finished gathering the rice from, from the lake, from the river, what, you know, what does it look like? Can you tell that it's been harvested? And then I'm also wondering when the season starts, you know, after the winter, is, are there no plants visible? Do they rise up? Like what, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, I wish I would have got some of those this summer. Um, I was looking for images of that too. Um, so the first question is, how does it look when it's first harvested? Yeah, like, I, I guess I'm wondering, when you harvest it, it, does it look like an open lake again? I, as I imagine it is at the beginning of the season, or is there still, you know, can you tell that you have been yeah. there? Yeah, so if, you, if at the beginning of the season, like let's say spring, you know, the ice thaws out and everything is gone and you can take your boat on there. If you look at this image on the screen, you won't see any of that. It'll, it'll just be um, like blank and you can just drive over it and you won't see it. There won't be any there. Um, so gradually, like uh, usually around June, once this, once this water gets a little bit warmer and the sunlight starts hitting it, you can see it kind of coming to the top. And all of a sudden it gets to the top and it lays down. It almost looks like grass, like on, on top of the water. So once it, it um, comes out of the water, it lays down. It looks like grass on top of the water. And for the whole month of July, you know, it's, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. And then finally, you kind of see it starting to come out of the water, you know, check up on it another day. And then pretty soon it's out of the water. And then, um, you know, a couple of weeks later, it's starting to form the husks that are on there. And then once the husks are on there, you can kind of see the, the liquid starting to come inside of it. Um, whenever you're fishing, people tend to just take a little quick ride over to the wild rice, kind of feel it. So oh, it still feels pretty empty in there. And then, um, and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, again, you check on it again, it gets a little bit harder. And then that's when you know. So the, the big cue to that one is looking at the, uh, the river rice. That's, that's the key. You check that one because that one's going to be ready first and usually a week week or two later um that's when you see the other the lake rice uh that'll be ready yeah that was my that was my next question why like, what is it about the speed of the water um i imagine the temperature of the water in the in the river compared to the lake how come it seems to be ready earlier yeah i think it has to do with the trees the the trees around it are, are um kind of um, blocking the wind so there's not really a lot of things to bug it you know from growing and all of a sudden it's getting hit by all of this uh, the sunlight you know that's hitting it and then already it has water right it needs water to grow so it has all of these factors that are kind of um you know it's almost like a wild rice on steroids where they're just kind of just boom it's all it's all there already um so so as uh, as you learn more about wild rice you tend to, you tend to learn these little things about it. You know, every time, like, you know, I've been wild racing since I was a kid and every year, like even now, I still learn a little bit of things about it, you know, and that just comes from analyzing the rice and asking questions. And, and, you know, there's always something to learn about it too. Like when I'm doing this presentation, I know that there's probably another way somebody does something or another way that they do it. Um, so, so that's why I'm telling people to be open about it. Um, but this is pretty much the process that, that we follow. 
Um, yeah, that, that's, does that answer your question? It does answer my question, yes. Um, okay, I have, the next question is, um, it actually is a, kind of follows up to what you said. I don't know how well you can answer this question, but someone asked how different is the process for growing slash harvesting uh, and cooking wild rice in different regions? Um, are you, can you answer that at all? Yeah, really? like, like yeah I've actually been, I've been to a few uh, wild rice camps before. Um, like I said, like Minnesota is, uh, is different than us, um, a little bit different, you know, just because they use that push pull more often. So I know that they use that push pull, but um, people are, um, are looking for new ways to speed up the process. So I was talking about that barrel, you know, that big uh, metal barrel uh, that's kind of hollowed out and yeah. kind of on an angle and they just pour it in there and the process is done a lot quicker. You know, that way you don't have somebody there that's actually um, um, physically using the paddle to stir it. It's got a machine that, tur that kind of spins it around. So I've seen that way done as well. I've also seen uh, like on YouTube videos, there's um, um, women that are that are dancing on the wild rice. So um, like I said earlier, like uh, the way we do it, we don't do that here, but that's the way we do it over there. Um, so I need to be respectful of that too. That's just the way that they were taught. And uh, it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's wrong or it's right. It's just another way to do it. So there's a lot of different processes like that. Um, some people uh, uh, like have a lot of time on their hands and, and they'll physically... Um, take the husks off with their fingers, you know, and just to get it done. And I thought about, you know, that's kind of a long way to do it. You know, you're going to be there all day. But at the same time, um, when, you're, when you're working with food, especially, um, you're actually putting energy inside of it when you're doing it. So um, when, whenever we do the wild rice process, we, we like to smudge first. So take, take uh, you know, get rid of some stress or whatever, so that you don't put that energy inside the food. So I can see why the, that some people tend to do that by hand, you know, they're in a good mood. And I always wondered that, you know, why would they want to do it by hand? You know, it would, it would take a lot of time, but uh, that's why they, cause they want to put that positive energy inside of it so that when somebody eats it, um, th they'll feel good about themselves. They'll have that positive energy and it'll transfer over to them. No, I have not heard that before. That's, that's really nice. Um, okay, I'm just, I'm noticing there are a few new questions have popped up. So one person is asking, is it possible to farm wild rice, Jason? And what kind of, I guess it's maybe this is, a, you've kind of just answered this a little bit. They've asked if there's any new uh, technology that you use. I imagine that barrel you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, I've seen uh, air boats. You know, they have, they have something that looks kind of like, uh, like a big shovel at the front where they're just kind of going along and they're, they're harvesting the wild rice. Um, so I've seen that done too. Uh, one of the things that, um, and this is more of the cultural part of it, is that we need to be respectful of the wild rice too. Um, you know, a couple of things that will happen is that, uh, you know, if we don't do that ceremony at the beginning of the year, um, the wild rice spirits will feel like they're disrespected and you might not have wild rice one year. If you're not harvesting the wild rice, like you're not using this gift that's given to you, then the, then the next year uh, you probably won't have any wild rice. So, um, so in our communities, um, about three or four years ago, there was hardly anyone um, harvesting wild rice. I think it was just me and my uncle that were on this lake called Ottertail Lake. And um, the, the canoes were down there. Um, anybody could go down there and, and use a canoe, um, but they weren't harvesting it. So um, the, the year after that, there was hardly any wild rice. And actually the, the rice um, blew down, you know, a big windstorm came and knocked down all the wild rice and that was because people weren't harvesting it so this gift was given and mm. but it wasn't taken so um so the spirits of uh, wild rice kind of felt disrespected so they said fine you know uh, you don't want it wind came and um there was no more wild rice after that that windstorm wow wow okay um okay someone is asking uh, what's the difference between wild rice uh, that is black and wild rice that is more of a brown gray color? Maybe this is related to the green rice that you were talking about too. Yeah, yeah, there's different strains of them too. Like um, there's long grain wild rice and there's short grain ones too as well. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I think about it when I think about it because it's just the, the area that you grow in and the water that it's in, um, you know, it's just a different lake. Like the, this lake on here is a really clean lake. 
uh, I think it's a spring water fed lake. Okay. Um, so the, the right, the water is really clean. Um, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Sometimes it's the process too. Um, maybe somebody um, just, just cooked it a little bit differently, or maybe they used a machine. Like um, people can tell when you, when you have factory rice, like it doesn't have that, that taste to it. You know, it's kind of got actually no taste to it. And that's the ones that you find that are like really cheap that you find at gas stations or maybe you find them at Safeway. Um, the factory rice, you can tell that it's been processed uh, mm -hmm. differently. So it doesn't have that, um, that roasting to it. You know, they've done it a different way. Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I see out there. And I know right off the bat, like hardly anyone I know buys that rice um, because they know, because they know that. They know that the, the taste isn't in there. And they know that they should go to you and Nancy to get it, well, right? <laughs> everybody that has some, yeah. We're like 1% of the people that rice hundreds. Um, okay, we, I'm gonna, I've got two more questions. I know it's eight. Are you all right to answer them? Yeah, okay. let's keep Great. going. So uh, someone's asking if cranberries and wild rice grow together. Yeah, I don't think they grow together, but uh, um, that, that's a really good recipe right there. Wow. Uh, if you put them together, like in a casserole, wow, uh, that's amazing. That's what I had last week for, for my lunch, um, wild rice with cranberries and they were organic ones too, man, they were good. They were the dried ones. Um, so, so when we put them in the oven, uh, the taste came out, um, wow, it was awesome. No, they don't grow together, okay. but uh, they're really good though. Especially if you want to make like a bread out of them. Wow. Wow. Look at that. That sounds really good. Yeah, making me hungry, actually. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Jody Johnson. Hi, Jody. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for joining. Um, she's asking, uh, when you're working with manumen, are you replanting it as well? So are you spreading it where you harvest? Yeah, yeah. Kind of um, what you, what you want to do is like you want to be that part too. You want to be the helper of the wild rice as well. So when you're knocking the wild rice, um, when the canoe is first going through, it kind of shakes it a little bit. The person in the front kind of knocks uh, the rice by accident. So some of those seeds will fall into the water, but it's not just humans that are helping with the wild rice. Like you have these birds that are, that land on it. And when they land on it, when it's really ripe, it shakes. And then some of it falls into the water. So um, it's the animals that are helping to do that as well. So each time you shake it, when it's really ripe, it falls back into the water. So um, that's, that's the good thing about it is you're thinking about next year and being respectful to it too and having these positive thoughts around it. So yeah, yeah, you're trying, that's how you're replanting it. Okay, okay. You know, I, I do have one more question for you, Jason, and it has to do with, I'm thinking about um, fall harvest because I've been to uh, fall harvest uh, with seven generations and Rainy River District School Board up in Fort Francis. And I think about um, the, all the kids that you have that, that gather around all the different stations, but especially the wild rice harvesting. And I, I think about, um, how you're teaching them about what's going on. And I'm also wondering about you as a child, when you were younger and you were learning, like, because uh, to me, it's not necessarily, there, there isn't always an explicit lesson happening go, going on. It's really observation and trying things on your own. So when you were growing up and you were learning uh, about harvesting wild rice year after year, like, what did that look like? How? You know, was there explicit things from your grandmother, from Nancy, or is it really about learning, you know, some of the processes on their own? You know, for example, you said uh, some of the wood burns hotter than others. How did you figure that out? Well, um, some of it, you, you, as your child, you just do what you're told. So, you know, there's a reason behind it. So you just do what you're told. So then you put the wood in there and then you do it a certain way. You put in the, the, the jack pine and then you add the uh, the birch and then you just kind of follow it along the way and um you know you know that um you're learning how to do it and they're teaching you how so you just follow it as you go as you go along but at the same time like um i was always asking questions like i, I would go and see my uncle do it i'd see my my grandma do it and i notice the differences that they're doing it and i would ask them why so it was always my grandma that would give me the reason why she does it that way and then I said, well, how come, um, how come uh, my uncle or how come my dad is finished before you? 
and then you 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 finish like three minutes later or something like that and she says oh that's because he doesn't roast it long enough and sure enough you know that that uh, year his his rice went moldy so um and then the same thing happened with my uncle uh uh previous year like he he sent it through the machine and it still had uh, a lot of those husks on there and then i asked coco i said well, how come you send it through the uh the machine a little bit longer than he does oh because i want to get all the husks off and then i tried his wild rice and then he had a little bit of husks in there so then uh, i learned at a very early age that um just do what my grandma does you know don't <laughs> ask questions you'll ask, you'll find out later and um as i'm older now like i i ask her as much questions as i can because i know that she's um she's had this knowledge that's been passed down to her that that's thousands of years old you know each generation had passed it down and then she got that from her grandmother all of these teachings so she was doing what she was told so i know that when she's passing something down to me that information is literally thousands of years old from all these generations so I know that I need to listen and I need to follow. And even if I don't understand it, just do it the way I'm told. And as I get older, I'll understand it a lot more. Wow. Well, you know what, Jason, I feel like that is actually like a great uh, spot to stop because I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge. And I want to thank Nancy for sharing her knowledge with you. And I want to thank all the generations before her who have passed that down, you know, basically to us now. Uh, and so I really appreciate the time and the effort that you've given to sharing this uh, knowledge with us. And uh, thank you so much, Jason. Are there any final words? Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, this information is not meant for me to have, it's meant for me to pass on. So anytime I'm giving information, I got to make sure I do my part and pass it on. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do the best I can. And I'm still learning about wild rice too. Like I don't know everything there is to know. This is just what I know so far. And I hope everybody enjoyed it and that they can use these teachings in the future to help them help themselves. And uh, um, good luck to everybody out there. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Jason. Jason has generously offered to share the PowerPoint with everyone. So I'm going to put it on our website and I will share a link to that page uh, momentarily if you want to download that PowerPoint uh, to reference on your own. So thanks again, Jason. I hope you have a great night and I hope everyone else has a great night too. Thank, Thank you. you. Be safe.